Good afternoon and welcome to a history of Christianity. So glad that you could join me this afternoon for our continuing saga of the seemingly endless story of the Christian church. Okay, it's not endless story. It's 2,000 years though, and we're covering what well, we've covered now just over the midway point. So we're doing great. Um, welcome. Glad that you're here today. Glad that you are a part of... Um, our conversation, our continuing conversation as we look at the history of the church and the way in which the things that have happened a long time ago, I mean a long time ago, affect us right now. And it may not seem like that. It may not seem like something that happened a thousand years ago could have an impact on who we are as Christians right now but it most certainly does. And it is good for us to take the time to think about and listen to these stories so that we can figure out how we as the church are functioning right now. What we can learn from the past, both the good and the bad, and knowing where we have come from, we can see where we are so that we know where we are going. Now, as you may have noticed on my um, lively um, board here, the other Pastor Grant in the household has been leaving messages for members of St. James. And so this is just a shout out to everybody from St. James. Um, she couldn't list everybody's name because I chased her away from the board. <laughs> And so, so hi, everybody. Glad that you're here, but I'm going to erase the other Pastor Grant's graffiti. Um, but I will, um, I will return her um, the favor um, when she has her next Bible study. So there we are. <laughs> I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. And it is always a, it, it has been just the greatest treat to be able to share one of the things that I love doing, and that is not only studying history, but relating that to um, our contemporary context. This is this is fun for me. I love doing this. And so I'm glad that you continue to come along for the ride. Um, it has been, I think, an important thing, especially to do in the midst of this pandemic. It has given us an opportunity to look to look at things that we normally would not look at, especially like, well, honestly, this one, monasticism in the medieval church. And honestly, if there is a topic and a period of time that couldn't feel less relevant to, well, 21st century, especially Protestant Christians, right? Luther left the monastery. He left the monastery with such vigor that he not only left, but he encouraged others to, le to leave and to shut the whole things down, right? Married a former nun while he was at it. So monasticism in the medieval church doesn't seem like that's one of those things that automatically rings a bell of relevance for us as 21st century Christians, especially 21st century Protestant Christians. And so you're thinking, well, pastor, you've got a pretty tough road to hoe on this one. But I want you to think about what monasticism really was. It was an attempt, it goes all the way back into the earliest days of the church, to find a way to live out what it means to be a Christian every single day. To take it seriously. To take it so seriously that they would actually give their lives to the pursuit of living as they thought that they were called to live, to take it so seriously that they would actually give up everything to do it. Now, I'm not going to encourage people to run off to the monastery, although, hey, that's a thing that can still happen. 
And there actually is a Lutheran monastery right here in Michigan, up in Oxford, St. Augustine's house. Great people up there, right? Father John Cochran was the one who put the stole on me at my ordination. So I'm all for our the last vestige or the only vestige in America of Lutheran monks. But I think that seriousness, that totality of living the Christian life, that's something that is admirable. Even if we don't go to the full extreme, there is something about the realization that our Christianity is not something that we just put on on Sundays. It's not just this thing that we do every now and then. It's the life that we live every single day. And so, yeah, I think monasticism, even from the medieval period, has a lot to say to who we are as Christians today. And maybe it serves as a challenge to us as Christians today. Maybe, just maybe, what we need to do is to take what Jesus said and how to live, about how to live, more seriously. Right? I don't think that the church is suffering from a lack of seriousness. But it may be suffering from a lack of living it out. I mean, we mean well. But how often do we put those good intentions into action? How often do we live what we say we believe? And so this sets us up very nicely, sets us up very nicely for what we're going to be doing today, because we're going to be looking specifically at two monastic houses, two groups of monks, and they're going to emerge out of the remnants of the 11th century, where we were talking about last time about the Crusades, right? And this is just, this is a fascinating and important and vital, I think, expression of the Christian life. And I think we, as modern, especially Protestant Christians, dismiss it too easily, too comfortably, too quickly. Right? Because we say, well, I certainly couldn't do that. I'm certainly not going to give up my whole life and go move to a monastery or a convent and, and give up everything. And But in saying that, we have a tendency to say, so that means I really don't have to do anything that Jesus called us to do. Right? And saying, well, I can't do that. So, well, I, I just won't. Things to think about. These are just things to think about as we get going. So, here we have it. Late 11th century. Um, the monasteries, especially those who were the Cluniacs, right? Remember, I mentioned those a few weeks ago. So there was the monastery at Cluny, and it had been so successful, and people really engaged with this new way of thinking, or a recovery of an old way of the seriousness of living out the Christian faith in every waking and sleeping moment, right? Cluny took off. Um, it wasn't just in Cluny. There were Cluniac, right? Just monasteries um, based on the ideas of Cluny. There are Cluniac monasteries that popped up all over Europe within just a few short decades. And so by the late 11th century, Cluny, the, the mother house, was powerful, right? They had all sorts of revenue coming in. They were building massive monasteries with huge libraries. I mean, they were putting together some of the most impressive collections of books in all of Europe. And not just Christian, right, authors. They're talking everything they could get their hands on, right? And so this is just an important and fundamental thing. They're building all over the place, and they're growing. And because of that, they're growing in prestige and 
power. You can't control that much land and you can't have that many people flocking to become a part of this new thing and not start to be able to throw your weight around. And there's an interesting thing that happens though, is that like rock bands that all of a sudden get really big, sometimes they get a little less innovative, less edgy, less cutting edge. They get comfortable. They get wealthy and they have power and they start to be able to try to wield that and throw that around. And that feels, when you're first doing that, feels pretty good. But after a while, you start to realize that the thing that made this work the edges start to get sanded down. And the rigorousness with which they started all of this, right? We are going to go back and we're gonna live the rule of St. Benedict and we are gonna be serious and austere and we're gonna, mm, everything is gonna be right on the money. And then all of a sudden, yeah, you're not, right? You're just not, it's not happening. And so, What's going to happen? Well, with the growing power and prestige, with popes now who are former Cluniac monks themselves, it causes a reaction. People are going to say, well, yeah, that's great. But man, they went corporate, right? I mean, there were people who could have been following any indie band at any time in anybody's career. And they said, yeah, they're sellouts. Did you listen to their last album? It was safe. That's what they were saying about Clooney. They've gone soft. They've sold out. They're more concerned about power and prestige than they are with living the monastic life. It wasn't the worst critique in the world, right? It was certainly accurate, too. I mean, yes, there were a good number of Cluniac monks who were as dedicated and as serious and, and as austere and ascetic as you could possibly want. But yeah, they had, they'd cashed in. They'd done pretty well for themselves, and they were enjoying the fruits of their labor. But as they were getting more content and growing in power and structure and prestige and buildings and all the rest. Society was also growing. Remember, I talked a couple episodes ago about the fact that during the 11th century, society really started to settle down. The lowering of violence, the increase in crop yields had created, well, better conditions, better living conditions for a lot of people. In the late 11th century, populations were on the rise. Um, there was actually a small upsurge in average temperatures, so it was just warmer generally throughout um, Europe in a positive, constructive way, not like what we're seeing right now. Things were better. Society was growing, thriving. They had time right? For the first time in a long time, the church was now going after heretics again. And you're thinking, no, Dr. Grant, that's a bad thing. No, actually, it, I mean, bad for the heretics, absolutely. Berenger of Tours and other guys like that really were not happy about it. But it meant that the church actually had time to think and expand and explore and poke and prod at theological conundrums that had been bubbling for centuries, but nobody really had time to worry about it when you're just trying to figure out how you're going to survive. So things were better. But what that meant is that those people who were really looking for that serious dedication to a life in Christ, we're looking around society going, well, where am I going to find that? Not at the Cluniac monasteries. Life's pretty good there. A lot of people wound up in the monasteries because it was a healthier place to live. Yeah, you gave up your obedience and you gave up human sexuality, although not as often as you might think. I mean, honestly, right? Getting a little 
chuckle from the um, other side of the room here. Honestly, you, you can't put that many human beings together and not expect now. Never, nevertheless, I'm moving on. <laughs> but there is this renewed desire in this time, in the late 11th century, for the simplicity of the apostolic life, the rigorousness of following the rule of St. Benedict to the letter, giving your life to Christ in a way that didn't feel cheap and simplified and easy. Right? This reaction is going to be felt both at a corporate level and as a personal level. People are, especially those who already have that inclination, they're looking for individual solitude, for private prayer, for reflection, for study, for focus, to drown out the world, or at least to block it out, to live a life focused on the mystery of God and the life of Christ and the theological realities of all of this. So into that mix, we're going to get our first major monastic reform of the late 11th, early 12th century. And these are the Cistercians. Um, that actually is just essentially a anglicization of the Cistercius because these groups, they were founded in Citeaux, France. This is great. Monasteries generally um, and monastic reform movements generally are named after the places where the first monastery was built, right? In this particular case, in Citeaux, France. Um, think Northeast France. All right. They were searching for a simpler and more secluded form of the monastic life, and they're going to find it in this group called the Cistercians. They're going to reject the vast corporate wealth of the Cluniacs, they're going to reject what they saw as a bloated and excessively ritualized liturgy. They're going to reject the grand, um, seemingly ostentatious buildings of the Cluniac churches, even on the monastic grounds. They did everything big and bold and detailed and all of the rest. And it's awesome, but it also can strike people as way over the top. And so, that coupled with the Cluniac's definite recent and significant interest and involvement in worldly affairs, remember the whole Pope Gregory VII against Henry IV thing? The Cluniacs all weighed in with Gregory. Gregory was a Cluniac, right? And so if you wanted to get away from all of this grand, over-the-top, um, political, you know, excessive, all you needed a place to go. And at the moment, there wasn't anything except in the year 1098. A group that frankly was a bunch of malcontents. <laughs> They looked at the, the what was going on at the time, and they're like, no, 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 that's not going to work. We need something simpler, something more basic, something more rigorous. And so this group of malcontents gathered in the middle of nowhere. I mean, and Citeaux in 1098 was, wow, it's the middle of nowhere. Um, it's a place that even the monks... Um, who started this um, new group, they used an old text from Deuteronomy, and they said this was a place of howling wastes and vast solitude. Right? Isn't that awesome? That's a great description. It was in the middle of nowhere, 
and nobody wanted to go there, right? Choose one of the most miserable spots away from just about everybody, and that's where they built. That's where they started because they knew only the truly serious were going to go there. What they wanted was to revive that primitive Benedictine rigorous ascetic observance, right? These are the monastic hours every three hours starting at 3 a.m. Prayer offices every three hours, study and prayer in between, and when you weren't studying or praying or in one of the prayer offices, you were at work supporting your monastery. Um, the Cistercians, um, one of their more rigorous offshoots, still Cistercians, but even more austere, even more um, serious about it are the Trappist monks. You may have heard of them. <laughs> the reason I love the Trappists is because they have been brewing the best beer since the Middle Ages. That was their industry, right? The, the, the monks at Citeaux right now make cheese. That's what they do. One of my favorite monasteries in Michigan is up in the UP. Um, it's, um, I think they're Eastern Orthodox. And they have a little shop where they make jams and jellies and the best pound cakes and fruitcakes in the world. And you're thinking, fruitcake? Nobody likes fruitcake. Oh, you would from them. It's called the jam pot. Oh, it's amazing. But that's what they do. That's their industry. That's how they sell just enough to support themselves. I mean, and it made sense. In many ways, this desire for renewal was spurred on by a church and a society that had grown comfortable. And you're thinking, it's the 11th century, Dr. Grant. How in the world could this be comfortable? Well, relatively speaking, it was comfortable, almost domesticated. And these people were looking for something more vigorous, not unlike the earliest Christian monasteries and the earliest Christian monks, who after Constantine said that Christianity was now legal, they were like, well, how do you really live the most vigorous form of the Christian life if you can't actually literally put your life on the line. That's what they looked at. They looked at the Christian martyrs as people to lift up and to admire and to live that, right? The highest form of Christian witness, as far as they were concerned, was to literally give your life for the faith. And after Constantine said, yep, no, it's legal. And everybody's like, well, now what do we do? Well, that's when monasticism really kind of took off. Because giving your life, well, maybe you couldn't do it literally, but this is pretty close, right? You go off to a monastery, you seclude yourself there, you cut yourself off, and you give over every waking moment to the, to the prayers of the church. And that's what monks did. They pray on our behalf because they know that not everybody can actually do that. And so the prayers are being lifted for you and for me right now by monks and nuns all around the world. That's what they see as a part of their task, is to lift us up by this constant state of prayer and praise. It's amazing. It really is. And that's what they wanted to get back to. They wanted to strip away all the other accretions, all the other stuff had, that had kind of scabbed over that ultimate goal. And so they looked to the most vigorous, rigorous way of living the Christian life that they could possibly imagine. Now, this new monastery, and it, um, we have a little bit of it still, right? Um, as you can see over here, that's the old part. This is the newer part. When they talked about austerity, they started with their buildings. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, but man, this was stripped. There wasn't much to it at all. 
I mean, you look at that, you're like, wow, that's it looks like an a dorm and not a good one. The dorms that kids don't want to stay in. That's how serious they took it, even in their living quarters. This doubled um, at certain times throughout the history of the Soto um, Monastery as both the place where the monks lived and their library. The monastery there, this group of monks, they kind of stumbled along for a while until somebody came on the scene that's going to, well, give them what they needed. And it's this guy, a guy named Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux. This young Bernard sought entrance and brought 30 other young men with him. And in 1115, they decided to leave Sato. And they formed a new community in Clairvaux, not that far away, still in the middle of nowhere. I mean, honestly, they didn't pick any of these places because they were gorgeous and all that kind of stuff. They chose them because they were wastelands in the middle of nowhere. The reforms that Bernard of Clairvaux instituted are going to reinvigorate what he had argued was a moribund and self-satisfied Christianity as expressed especially by the Cluniacs. It was a restoration of that primitive rule of St. Benedict. Very serious, very much living to the letter of this rule, and it applied to everything, right? Remember that building? They took that as kind of a signpost for just about everything. Everything was going to be simplified. Everything. Dress, food, architecture, furniture, you name it. The Cistercians um, wore a coarse habit, that gown, of undyed sheep's wool. And they didn't work it real hard. They wanted it to be kind of uncomfortable and scratchy. Right? Because, you, well, they were no fashion plates. Let's just say that. But that was on purpose. They wanted to be seen as plain, basic. The, all the ornaments of the monastic church would be made of wood or iron, no precious metals. You will not find a lick of gold or silver or even bronze in their churches. Nothing, right? It was just simple, straightforward. Wood, iron, that's it. All decorative sculpture was banned. No images. Architecturally, the early Cistercian churches did not have decorated facades. No beautiful front parts of the church like you see in so many cathedrals and churches, even smaller churches in Europe. Nothing. Simple, straight, plain. Many of them didn't even have towers. Just a building. That's it. Inside was just as stark. Clear, clean lines, a lack of any adornment. They picked the sites for their monastic houses for seclusion and enclosure. And they didn't even do the things that other monastic houses did during the Middle Ages. They didn't accept manorial rents, which means that the peasants around them didn't pay rent to the monastic houses, which they did in other places, especially the Cluniacs. They didn't take over possession of anybody else's churches. They were going to build their own simple ones. They weren't going to take the little village church and say, aha, that's ours now, which is what the Cluniacs had been doing. They didn't accept tithes from the people. They didn't even accept serfs, which you think, wait a minute, accept serfs? Yeah, I mean, the other monastic houses would take on people as their property. That's another one of those things in the Middle Ages that we really don't want to remember, but we have to. Right? And the Cistercians were like, nope, not going to do it. They had no means of outside support, so they intended to live by their own labor, just 
as Benedict, way back when in the 6th century, had directed. And here's the interesting thing, though. Labor was seen both as an ascetic exercise. You do this as a way of mortifying the body to show your dedication to the faith, but also as a means of producing everything they needed, including food. Here's the thing, though. They still maintained the daily prayer offices, all of them throughout the day, including a full daily mass, right? Full daily Eucharistic um, celebration, which meant that they were trying to produce enough food as part-time farmers. Um, and ask yourself a question. How many guys, like this guy, do you think were farmers before they decided to be monks? Right? I'm just going to let that one linger out there for a moment. Think there are many of them that were farmers before they became monks? Do you think they were particularly good farmers when they got started? Think many of them just absolutely grew right into the job? Oh, I love farming! No. So... <laughs> Knowing that they were trying to do everything and realizing that that was not going to happen, they instituted a fairly novel reform. They decided that they should accept both lay brothers and employ local laborers. These lay brothers, essentially um, people who wanted to live the monastic life but couldn't really live the monastic life fully, right? Um, these were called conversi, and they took vows. They wore a very simple habit, but they did not live with the monks in the monastery. They lived back with their families. They didn't attend all the prayer offices. They didn't even have to sing when they did attend. They were essentially there as what we would call lay people who were deeply invested in their place of worship and their place of living out the Christian faith. But what was really important, though, is that the Cistercians then sanctified this manual labor that they provided and that many of the monks would work with these men in the field. They allowed these lay brothers this ideal of monastic life that they could actually attain, right? By working the fields for the monks and by see, being seen as a part of the community, they could give of themselves in the ways that they could. It was seen as hard work that was acceptable, an acceptable sacrifice to God. So even if you didn't have any money to give, right? Not even the widow's might. If you put in a good hard afternoon's work for the monks, that could be seen as living sacrificially for God. And that also had the added benefit of allowing the fully professed brothers, the full monks, to go pursue prayer and reading and all the rest. It was fascinating. And so not only were you taking in these monks, these people who wanted to be serious and dedicated round the clock, you also opened the doors in some way to, well, regular folks. Yes, in the beginning it was just men, but there will be Cistercian convents that will open. There will be a place for women to go. And they will also have conversi these lay people, lay women, who will be able to work with these convents. And so you're involving even more. It's not democratic, but certainly more open than what the monasteries had been before. It recognized that the hunger for spiritual exercise, as it were, was not limited just to that sliver of folks who wanted to live the monastic life all the time. They recognized that people with families wanted this same kind of opportunity to give an acceptable sacrifice to God of their time and their talents, right? 
and they did. It was interesting, too, because Bernard was charismatic, profoundly ascetic. I mean, he lived the most severe, rigorous expression of this monastic life. He was deeply spiritual. Man, he was like the perfect advertisement for the Cistercian ideal. Although, <laughs> have to admit, right, while Bernard spoke of the Cistercians as the restorers of this lost, real, true religious tradition, his rigorousness um, took some fairly extreme measures. But most people during the Middle Ages bathed regularly, probably at least, at least once a month, right? This whole myth that uh, people in the Middle Ages never bathed, mm -mm 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 -mm. that's pop culture, that's not real history. Bernard, on the other hand, never bathed, right? His mortification of the flesh, and so that sums time inflicting wounds. He didn't, didn't clean him up, didn't clean himself up. The man was as charismatic as the day as long as, long as he was standing downwind from you. <laughs> Not charming, right? But people saw that as the seriousness and the dedication to the whole thing. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But hey, right? But his seriousness, people saw it. And they took his devotion just as seriously. And it moved them. Anybody willing to live that extreme of a lifestyle, that devoted to the church and to the faith, it meant something. And he was brilliant. Probably one of the best preachers of the early 12th century. No doubt about it. His preaching was so good, in fact, that one of his friends, who would go on to become Pope, um, Eugene the Third actually asked him to preach the beginning of the Second Crusade. That's how good he was. And even though he was preaching into a very difficult situation, the crusading state that had formed um, in the, what they called it the county of Edessa, right? The first major crusading state, it had fallen, Right? Christians in Europe were freaked out. They were thinking, oh my goodness, how could this have possibly happened? We're, we've got God on our side. And everybody's like, well, maybe. And so you're thinking, who is going to be able to get us motivated to go back? And the Pope looks to Bernard of Clairvaux and says, hey, can you help me out here? Done. And it lit the flame all over again. Not surprisingly, the Cistercian order is going to grow at a fantastic rate. And by the end of the 12th century, guess what? They had taken on many of the same trappings as the Cluniacs from the previous century. The very same ones that they had been critiquing, all of a sudden, they were in a similar boat. They had accumulated some of the same problems and some new ones, too. Right? They had a reputation for arrogance. Oh, yeah, you can see where that comes from. And avarice. They were very tight with their money. And they were making a lot. All that hard work was paying off, make no mistake. And not surprisingly, there was a significant amount of exploitation of those lay brothers. For all of their statements about wanting to live in the middle of nowhere, well, they were living in the middle of nowhere in a lot of places, and all of a sudden they had massive land acquisition, often at the expense of the peasants who were trying to work the land. And while they didn't take on serfs, they did depopulate by force villages so that they could take the land and say, see, we're not taking the people. No, you just kicked them all out of their own village. That's not awesome. That's not great. The Cistercians had become as worldly 
as those they had originally castigated. Right? And so into this seemingly repeating cycle of foundation, growth, power, torpor, and then renewal, and we see this spin out, a new player is going to emerge at the beginning of the 13th century. So this is the early 1200s. And these are ones that you probably have heard of. Um, in fact, we have a soup kitchen down on Connor and in other places around Detroit filled with folks just like this. Franciscans. The Franciscan order is going to emerge amidst this cycle that seems to be repeating itself. Instead of a typical order that forms as a way of renewing this moribund expression of the enclosed, right? The cloistered, secluded Benedictine community. This group are called the Friars Minor, right? Or the Lesser Brothers. The Franciscan order is going to abandon enclosure and seclusion altogether. They're not even going to build houses. They're not going to build churches, at least not in the beginning. They are going to engage in direct, active pastoral ministry. They are going to take that monastic vow and that intention to live as Christ lived right to the people. And it makes a lot of sense in the context into which they are emerging. Because in the early 13th century, we see a number of things that are going on. You've got rapid urban growth. So the cities are growing. You've got prolonged economic and demographic expansion. Economies are getting better. The population is growing. You've got a lot of expansion of international trade. International communities of learning have now come online. Starting in the late 11th century, we get universities for the very first time. The oldest university in all of Europe is the University of Bologna. It was founded in the year 1088. By this time, Paris, Oxford, and Cambridge have all been formed. Right? So this is a new thing. And you've got this new thing. It's called the middle class. It's just starting to get going, right? It's not the aristocracy, and it's not fully just the peasants. These are folks in the middle. These are folks that have significant skill levels, craftsmen, craftspeople, right? People who have a skilled trade, and they're starting to use that to, I know, make money and start to lift themselves up a little bit. And so what this is all producing is a society that was more concentrated in urban centers, people who are a little bit more mobile than they've ever been before. Definitely the whole level of education is coming up a little bit. By no means are most people literate at this point, but it's coming up. And you're starting to get, well, more money in the system, more affluence. It's growing. The society is emerging once again. And these new social realities created a populace that was more critical and skeptical of traditional religious practice and dogma. Right? They didn't want you to tell them what to do. They wanted you to show them how to live and then walk with them, work with them. They were tired of essentially the hand of God pointing down from the pulpit, be it whatever it was, and saying, you people have to do this, X, Y, and Z, and that's the only way that you're ever going to get into heaven. There's a certain amount of anti-clerical frustration that's going to grow. They're going to be like looking at the church and like, you guys keep telling us what to do, but you keep turning around and you certainly look like just princes of the world. We, we'd like a little consistency be, between what you're telling us to do and how you're living. 
that would be awesome, right? That would be awesome. And they were really frustrated with the fact that the higher you up, went up in the um, church hierarchy, the more worldly they seemed to be. The Pope at the time was a guy named Innocent III, and he wielded the kind of authority both in the spiritual and in the civil realm that Gregory VII only dreamed of. This guy was in charge of everything. And people really had serious questions about whether the church should be doing something like that. The church in the existing monastic order seemed to be completely unable to meet the needs of the people at that time. The systems were simply outdated. The diocesan and parochial structure developed to serve the needs of a generally rural, uneducated population and to essentially kind of keep them contained. Now they've got a increasingly urbanized, more educated population. To put it in our terms, um, they were analog. The church was analog in a digital world. They were attempting to continue to do ministry as they'd always done, even though the times have changed. It's like congregations right now who still pretend that it's 1957 or 1983. Oh, remember the youth groups we had in the 80s? Those are gone. Why do you keep trying to do ministry for times that don't exist anymore? We've changed. Society has changed. Things have changed. Churches have changed. And yet we're the last people to seem to be wanting to admit it. Well, guess what? We've been doing this for a long time. The people of the early 13th century were desperate. They were yearning for something from the church, and they were getting the same old, same old. It's not that they wanted that Christ has changed, but the people who were running the institutional structures of Christ's church certainly seemed to be stuck in the mud. Does that sound at all familiar? Right? The, the truth of the gospel is timeless, but we exist in time. And we need to pay attention to the way in which society changes around us. I mean, you can pretend that the changes haven't happened or wish them back in the bottle. That's not going to make it happen. It's not going to make it happen. It leaves the church absolutely ill-equipped and unprepared to meet the needs of the people. And so in the early 13th century, those needs were involving and the desire for that yearning for connection with Christ and to live the life that Christ calls us to live, that was still there. People yearned for that. They were desperate for that, and they just weren't hearing it, and they didn't see it lived. Now, are our problems in the 21st century the same as the beginning of the 13th century? Not even close, but we understand that the desire may still be there. The question is, are we asking the right questions? And are we showing the faith? Are we showing a life of Christ for the people of this day? That's the question. And so the Franciscan friars, right, there are a number, uh, one of a number of groups of itinerant preachers. They moved from place to place. And not only did they preach, they lived the gospel. They took care of people. They went to urban centers and they preached and they lived as examples of the apostolic life. And they tried to walk the path that Jesus had laid out in his own life. And there living of the gospel. They're living it out in everyday life, in every moment of the day, that had an impact, right? 
It allows people to ask, how do I live my life? How do I express my faith? And the Franciscan says, by living as Christ lived. This guy, Francis, he's the one holding up the church. This is a famous piece of art by Giotto. The guy sleeping is Pope Innocent III. And what he is dreaming is he is dreaming that Francis is literally holding up the church. He is its foundation. People saw in Francis Christ, the way he treated people, the way he preached, the way he lived. Francis of Assisi, after hearing the gospel on the Feast of St. Matthias, it was Matthew 10, the sending of the disciples, Francis found the specific nature of his calling to preach to all the need for repentance. And Francis proposed a radical idea for all the Franciscan, for the friars, for the brothers who were going to enter this life. Their poverty was to be absolute. They would reject even the common ownership of the apostolic life. They would not own a building. They would own nothing. They would wander the world, sleeping in borrowed, humble places, begging for food. It was not a means to an end, right? It was simply the literal imitation of the earthly life of Christ. Right? You want to see Jesus? We're going to show you Jesus in what we do and how we live. This was not the life for everybody, but man, people flocked to these Franciscan preachers, especially Francis. That personal devotion to an identification with the humanity of Jesus, not just his divinity, but his humanity. They could feel in his preaching concerns and circumstances of their own lives. And they also heard and felt and received a compassionate participation in their sufferings and in Jesus' sufferings. There was connection. There was empathy. There was compassion. There was devotion. Francis showed that it was possible to live the gospel while living in the everyday world. And his message resonated deeply with people across the socioeconomic spectrum. Rich, poor, this new middle class that was emerging, they all looked at him and go, that's, that's what we were looking for. And Francis always made sure to point back to Jesus. Everything that he did. Northern European cities became the mission field for the Franciscans. And the renewal wrought by the Franciscan was to remind the church and the laity of the centrality of the earthly life of Christ, the things that Jesus did. Reconnecting the faithful to a more organic understanding of the faith and how one was to live out that faith. The Franciscans reshaped the direction of the church. It reminded everybody of the way in which our life is lived day to day. Our life in Christ is lived day to day. Those are the things that we are supposed to do. Heal, feed, teach, have compassion, empathy, lifting people up. All of those verbs of faith, those are things that we are supposed to do every single day. We're not just supposed to talk about them, we're supposed to do them. And the Franciscans went out there and lived that. And it is an amazing thing. And it made the church very nervous. The Franciscans and some of their other groups, like the spiritual Franciscans, scared the daylights out of the church. Right? I mean, they were way out there, and the church is like, whoa, wait a minute, we we want you to live the life of Christ, but not like, like actual Jesus. And that made things very interesting and difficult for the Franciscans. They were loved and hated by the church hierarchy. But the church needed them. And the church needed their reforms. In both cases, in both the Cistercians and 
the Franciscans, we see that they were trying to find ways to make sure that people knew that the faith was a lived experience, a day-to-day lived experience, and that it was for everybody. Maybe you couldn't do it where you actually moved to the monastery, or you couldn't give up everything and become a Franciscan and wander Europe. But there were access points for everybody, that this was a faith for everybody. It returns the faith back to that egalitarian roots of the time of Jesus and the disciples. That's important. And that return to that egalitarian root and foundation of the church is going to be one of the springboards as we get closer and closer to the Reformation. Because now you can almost start to see it from the 13th century on. The pieces are being put into place. All right. Thank you for joining me today. Um, It's a lot. I know I went a little over today, but this has been, it is an important period. And this is one of those occasions where it's, it's good for 21st century Christians to look back and say, oh yeah, this stuff does make a difference. And we can learn from something that happened eight, nine hundred, almost a thousand years ago. It does speak to us still. It is relevant as long as we've got the ears to hear it and the time to reflect on it and then to figure out what we're going to do with this and then go forward. So thank you for joining me today. Um, Please join me next week when I'm going to be talking about women and the church in the Middle Ages. Um, this is a, another huge topic. I'm going to try to give it down to a nice, tidy um, um, 50, 55 minutes, um, but I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you so much for joining me today. For those of you who will be watching this on YouTube, if you like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can just click the subscribe button and you will never miss another one of these videos. If you're watching this on Facebook right now and would like to keep up with all of this stuff, go to the YouTube channel for Genesis Lutheran dash Detroit and press the subscribe button. We would love to have you. And then you'll get notices whenever new videos are posted. So, Thank you so much for joining me today. Always a treat to be able to continue our conversation about the history of the church. I'm glad that you were with me today, and I look forward to seeing you next time.